All right, let's get started, please. Today we're going to talk about convolutional neural networks, extending what we've done on deep learning, but to focus especially on this particular type of network, which is used a lot in computer vision. Last couple of classes, we've been talking about this idea of neural networks that were simultaneously learning the basis and also the regression weights. And that's one way of thinking about it, but you can also just think about it as this crazy function that we're learning the parameters of to minimize our loss. And we usually use a lot of regularization. And the basic idea was this alternating between matrix multiplication and this nonlinearity or activation function that we were calling H to make them work. At the end of last lecture, we started talking about convolutions, which are this operation that you can perform on a signal or a sequence that is essentially a matrix multiplication, but we would like to think about it as we compute each point in the output by centering the filter there and then taking the dot product. And we showed that you can represent a whole bunch of nice things as convolutions, like averaging, approximating derivatives, and all that kind of stuff. So what we want to get to today is we want to talk a little bit about images. And essentially, all the stuff we talked about last time with 1D convolutions extends to 2D. So the signal is now a two-dimensional array. We can call it an image. The filter is a two-dimensional array. We can call it an image. And this is how you write it down. But in words, it's essentially the same thing. A pixel in the output is you take the filter, you center it there, and then you just do that dot product. But now you're actually multiplying along a little square or rectangle that's the size of the filter instead of just multiplying along one direction. Then you're summing up the whole thing. So these two sums here are the two dimensions of the filter. And you can also have convolutions in higher dimensions. And that's certainly useful in some cases in machine learning. But for today, we'll just focus on 2D images. And uh, or at least the way we're going to think about it is in terms of 2D convolutions. So I want to jump right into some code. And then we'll come back to the slides. So where's my mouse? OK. First, I just want to show you some examples of 2D convolutions. And I've picked this picture of a piece of a brick wall because it emphasizes some of the things that I want to demonstrate. So the first thing we can do is, well, let me comment this out for a minute. We can convolve it with the filter that looks like this. So the shape of this particular filter is 10 by 1. We're still thinking about it as two-dimensional, but one of the dimensions just happens to be 1. So what we're going to do is we're going to center this thing at some location on top of the brick image. And then we're going to basically do this averaging of those 10 pixels in a horizontal bar. So any guesses on what this is going to do to the brick image? Dim it. Dim it? OK. Um, not quite. Any other guesses? Matthew? Smooth it. OK, that's right. So what we saw last time was these kind of average looking. <sighs> Sorry, just drives me crazy. OK. Um, what we saw last time was that these filters, like Matthew said, they average things. But now we're only averaging or smoothing in the horizontal direction, because that's the shape of our filter. So here's what it looks like. And this is quite fundamental here. There's something slightly unintuitive that we need to grasp. The filter is horizontal. Thus, the edges that really get blurred are the vertical edges, the, these parts of the brick. And why does that really happen? Because the vertical edges 
are the ones where you have a lot of change along the horizontal direction. It's going from dark to light to dark. And so if I smooth that in the horizontal direction, I'm blurring those vertical edges. The horizontal edges, well, they look a little bit blurred. But theoretically, if they were just perfectly straight and uniform, then from the perspective of being horizontal, if they were just all white and I stuck the averaging filter on top of that horizontal edge, it wouldn't do anything. Any questions about this? Christian? Yeah, uh, what does happen with the points at the borders? Yeah, as with last time, I don't want to worry too much about the points at the borders. Uh, we can look at the code up above. I forget what I decided to do. Um, OK, I use symmetric boundary conditions. Um, that probably means that it's reflecting off the edge. And same just means I want the output to be the same size as the input. So there's, yeah, there's some edge details. And these uh, functions will allow you to pick how you want to handle it. <coughs> OK. So here's a different filter. It's just the original filter transpose. So it's now a vertical bar of 0.1s. And it now blurs the horizontal edges because I'm centering that bar over the horizontal edges and averaging the light and dark pixels to get a sort of blur. I can also take this filter. It's just a 10 by 10 grid of 0 0.01. By the way, the, the reason why I'm having them add up to 1 is it just has some nice properties, like it's kind of preserving the overall intensity or, or something like that. Um, if I had an image that was all a solid white, it would return back the same image, those kinds of properties. So if I convolve with this filter, now this is the first time we have a real actual 2D filter. So we're centering this 10 by 10 thing at each location above the bricks. And then we're doing that multiplication. And we get kind of, it's reasonable, right? It's, it's blurring in, in all directions. And the size of that filter, if it was 3 by 3, there would be less blurring. And if it was bigger, there would be more blurring. So we can do all kinds of stuff. I briefly mentioned last time that you can represent approximating derivatives like this. For, so for those of you who've seen it, this filter is the center difference formula, at least, well, not dividing by 2, but close enough. Um, <coughs> And so these results are very interesting. Why do they light up when we see edges like that? Because remember, this is a dot product, right? And if you're taking the dot product between two things, it's going to be large when those things are kind of collinear. And it's going to be small when they're at right angles. So the dot product is going to be large when the signal looks like the filter, meaning when there are patterns like negative, zero, positive, which is exactly what's happening at the edge. Uh, and I'm plotting the absolute value of the output, because the output's both positive and negative. And that's why it's picking up the up edges and the down edges. Um, then this is a primitive edge detector. So I mean, edges and derivatives are very related things, because edges occur when the intensity changes. That's what an edge means. Rob. And the reason it's just picking up the vertical lines is because it's a one by three. Yes, exactly. The reason it's just picking up the vertical lines is the same reasoning as before, because it's a 1 by 3 filter. And you could, again, make one that picked up both types of edges. OK, so we can do the same sort of vertical thing. We can, here I just added them together, which pretty much gets the job done. This, everything's linear here, so I expect that the sum, if I sum the filters, I'm expecting this to be the sum of those outputs, which it kind of looks like. So the point of all this is to give you an intuition about why we even care about convolutions in the first place, which is they are a way of, for a particular filter, they allow you to pick out certain features in the image. And you may want to know if you're predicting what's in the image, 
is there an edge here or not? Because you may say a certain shape is made out of a bunch of edges in a certain orientation. And because the filter is small, the output in one pixel over here, here the filter's three by three, only depends on the three by three neighborhood of pixels in the input. So we're basically saying whatever is happening here just depends on those nearby pixels. It doesn't depend on pixels way over there, which sort of makes sense. For my first step of processing the image, I want to just understand what's happening locally. And to say whether or not there's an edge there, I don't actually need to know what's going on across the room in some very far away pixel. Philip. Does it detect uh, diagonal? Yeah, can you detect diagonal edges? So yes, you can, not perfectly because you have to fit it into a three by three filter, but yes, you can construct filters that pick up diagonal edges um, by kind of doing your best to rotate them. And if the filter was a little larger, that would be a little more reasonable as well. But yes. Okay, so the last one here is just a filter that's just the number two. It's a one by one filter. So it's, I mean, convolving by that is just multiplying the whole image by two, basically. So the punchline for what's coming up today is that in convolutional neural networks, those filters are the things we're learning. Those are the weights. And we ha there's a lot more to talk about, but that's going to be the essential setup is, hey, I'm going to apply a bunch of convolutions with a bunch of filters, do some stuff to the output, but I'm not going to pre-specify what these good filters are. I'm going to learn those as I go along. Any questions about all this? Kevin looks amused. OK. So I'm going to show you now some demos of what these things are capable of. And then we'll go into the details of how they work. So um, this particular piece of software I'm using, Keras, we will talk about that next class on Wednesday next week. But for now, I'm just going to use it and not worry too much about it. And what I'm doing here is I'm grabbing a pre-trained network. So I don't, ha I don't have a bunch of training data, and I'm not doing gradient descent or any of that stuff. Someone already did this with a particular set of hyperparameters with a particular data set. They trained the thing, possibly for a long time, on a bunch of GPUs. And then they just posted it so that it's publicly available that anyone can access their trained network. And that's very con convenient for me to show you what the trained network can do without having to train it. OK, so this was trained on the ImageNet data set, which I think I mentioned briefly last time, which was this very famous, important data set where you're trying to say, what is it a picture of? And I went and got a few images to show you how it works. So this elephant, I just Googled for a public domain elephant image. I didn't, as far as I'm aware, this is not a training example that was used to train this network. And then we can run the predict function on this image and see what comes out. And there's a soft max, so it's coming out with a bunch of probabilities. But there's, I don't know, over 1,000 classes. So I'm just going to show you the top three so we don't need to look at 1,000 classes and their probabilities. So here's what it says. It's very interesting. Um, one of my students in my other class assured me this is actually an African elephant. I'm not personally able to tell, but, um, but maybe some of you are. So this is pretty impressive that not only does it know it's an elephant, but they trained it on so many classes that it's actually learning to distinguish even subclasses of the original class. So it's 75% confident-ish that this is an image of an African elephant. As I said, as far as I know, I just grabbed this image and it's not part of the training set. So I was trying to think of what other images to show you. And it was a bit awkward because I, well, I couldn't pick someone I knew without their permission, especially if I wanted to publish this, these lectures. So I figured 
whatever, I'll just pick myself. It's not because I'm super vain. I just didn't want to <laughs> do this without someone's permission. So here's my graduation photo from undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's see what the ConvNet has to say about this. <laughs> I thought, I thought this was pretty good. I mean, obviously this image was not in the training set. And obviously there is a bow tie and it's, it has a very high confidence, right? 97%. So uh, this isn't doing multi-label classification. We briefly talked about the distinction earlier that maybe you want to assign multiple labels. But I'm, I don't really see the oboe, but <laughs> I definitely see the bow tie. So. I found this relatively impressive. Yeah, Sasha. Uh, why do you think that, like, person is like, oh, that is not in the top? Yeah, why, why is person not in the top? So I don't actually know all the classes it was trained on. Um, maybe person wasn't one of them, or maybe there was just a whole bunch of subclasses and it wasn't confident enough about them. I'm not actually sure. But you can look up online image net categories and you can just see the list of all of them that it's choosing from. Connor? So, so like they were given the labels then? They were given the class? Like they're yeah, so this, this neural network, which by the way has 50 layers, which is kind of crazy. Last time we talked about having a bunch of layers. Um, yes, it's supervised learning. So it was given a giant data set of a bunch of images, including the label, which is which of these, however many categories it is. Um, and yet, I think it's still impressive that it can generalize to these new kinds of images, especially if we try to dig more into how hard this problem really is, which I hope we'll do today. So last one I wanted to show you, I, I thought this was good enough, but then I just noticed there was a picture of my office. Uh, this is my office. It's great. It has good natural light. Um, there's my desk. I have some stuff on the wall. So I figured um, this would be an interesting one to feed into the network because it's such a busy image. I have this nice rug and all kinds of blinds and windows. So um, I was quite interested to see the result. <laughs> I don't know what this says about uh, the career path that I've chosen, but uh, I was a little bit surprised for sure when I saw this. OK, so that is that. Let's go back to the slides. So here's the problem if you want to do image classification. The first thing we've been talking about in this course is, well, all, all the methods we've talked about since the beginning of the course operate on a vector, right? Decision trees, KNN, neural networks as of last class and so on. They take in some vector do some stuff to it, and then they output something. If you want to use an image as your input, then the most standard naive thing you could do is just flatten the image. You can just say, I'll just make it into a vector. But you throw away some very valuable information when you do that, because you lose the fact that this pixel is next to this pixel, because actually that pixel is way down here once I've flattened out the whole vector. So this is one issue with stuff pre today. Another one is the number of parameters. So I, I, this appears later in the slides as well, but just roughly, if these, these images are a few hundred by a few hundred pixels, so you're on the order of 10 to the 5 uh, inputs, and then maybe you want your first hidden layer to have 10 to the 4 size, then you're talking about a matrix of 10 to the 5 by 10 to the 4 is 10 to the 9 parameters just in your first layer, which is a lot of parameters. And that exposes us to a lot of overfitting. And I want to argue today that we don't actually need all of those parameters. We can throw most of them away, get less overfitting and faster speed. And that's actually what these convolutional networks are doing. <coughs> And the way we're going to do that is use this idea that we've been talking about with convolutions that maybe we care at first at least about some local properties. Like I'm using edge detection as a running example. That's not the only thing these networks learn to do. But if you want to do edge detection, I don't need to know 
everything about the image. I just need to know what's in this neighborhood to see if it looks like an edge. And yet, a fully connected network, like we've been talking about before, has this big W matrix. It says every Z in the first layer is a weighted sum of all the Xs, meaning all the pixels. And that's maybe overkill for what we're trying to do. So the key is going to be connecting the two sides here. These arguments I've been making now, and I've been talking about convolutions, and I want to show that they're really one and the same, and that convolutions are the way we want to go here. OK, so consider this 1D data set where we're trying to classify each point. So this is our feature. We call it time, but we're not going to think about that too much. Um, and we have this value, and this is supervised learning. So someone told us that this first part should be classified as class 1, and the second part should be classified as class 2, and this third part should be classified as class 3. So in this case, we only have one feature, which is the height of the thing. And we cannot just use that feature to tell us what to predict. It's true that when the height is low, we can say it's class 2. But when the height is high, we cannot just look at a single pixel and only look at its feature, which is the height, and from that alone say whether it should be class 1 or class 3, because both of those have large values. So what we're going to want to do is say, OK, I can't just look at a height and decide just from the height, is it class 1 or class 3? But maybe by looking at nearby pixels as well, or nearby elements in the sequence as well, I can actually classify. And we can see by looking at it that class 1 is kind of smooth and class 3 is kind of spiky. And maybe a convolution, in this case a 1D convolution, can pick up on that and give us a new feature that we can use to make the call of class 1 versus class 3. And if you pick a spikiness filter that is trying to detect derivatives or second derivatives or whatever it is, this is the output of the convolution. And from here, I can take this and say, well, the, the lower values of this feature are class 1, and the middle are class 2, and the third are class 3. Or I could combine this feature with the original height and use some sort of decision tree, and it wouldn't be too hard. I'll just say, if the original height is low, class 2, else if this feature is really big, class 3, because it's spiky, else class 1. So this is the general idea of how convolutions can give us new features that we can work with to try to classify stuff. And neural nets are all about learning these transformations and getting new features. And so where the story is going is that the layer of the convolutional neural network is learning convolutions to give us good next layers of features that we can then combine to do supervised learning, except we're actually going to do a whole bunch of layers of it instead of just one. Any questions or comments about this? OK. So this is a little bit of foreshadowing. Um, but another thing that we may want to do, and is actually frequently done in convolutional neural networks, um, is this idea of taking a bunch of different convolutions and then taking, or even for a single convolution, taking the maximum over a bunch of nearby values. So we can first take a convolution. That will give us the output. Then we can replace each value with the maximum of itself and some neighbors in the output space. And then, for example, if there's a spike anywhere around here, either the spike was right here and my value will be large, or the spike was right here and the next value will be large, 
but I'm taking the maximum of a little neighborhood. So if there's a spike somewhere around this place, then I'm going to get a large value, which is going to help me classify. OK, here comes the bridge between the convolution world and the neural network world. Because what is going to turn out is that this convolutional neural network that we're slowly motivating and defining is actually a special case of a regular neural network. It's a special case where we add some extra constraints on the Ws. And, and other than that, it's roughly the same thing. And so what is a regular neural network? It's a bunch of matrix multiplication. So let's talk explicitly about how a convolution is just a matrix multiplication and what does such a matrix look like. So <coughs> excuse me. The output of a convolution is the dot product between the filter W and that region of X. That's what this notation is. And we can make a big vector W tilde that just has zeros all around it. And that way, it becomes the same size as x. We're just talking about 1D here. And we can put the zeros so that it's shifted where it's supposed to be. And then we can take the dot product of those two things. And that's going to give us an element of the output. OK, this is an important matrix for today. So I'm happy to spend three minutes on it, um, or, or, or four. Um, let's think about what it means when I take this matrix and multiply it by some vector x. OK, you all know how matrix multiplication works. Let's imagine some vector x sitting here. I take the first row, boom. It's going to take w multiplied by that first part of x, and then 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So that is like centering w at that first part of x doing the dot product, and then the rest just gets thrown away. That's what it's supposed to do. Take the second row of the matrix, rotate it, dot product. Well, that first 0 there is like saying that w vector gets shifted by 1 relative to x, because now w is hitting the second element of x, the third, the fourth, the fifth, et cetera. And that gives me the second element of the output. And then the third one is shifted over by 2. I do 0 times the first thing in x, 0 times the second thing in x, and then I start doing my multiplying. So what I'm claiming is that for 1D, we're just talking about 1D now, taking the 1D convolution of a filter W with a signal x is the same as doing matrix multiplication, this matrix multiplied by x, where this matrix needs to be um, OK, I guess in this case, um, well, the matrix needs to be repeat. The w needs to be repeated the right number of times, depending on the size of x. So if w was a really small filter, you'd have a whole bunch of w's, a whole bunch of rows in the matrix. Let's take some discussion about this, because this is not that straightforward. Let's get some questions about why this matrix multiplication is the same as a convolution. Usually, one optimistically interprets silence as a good sign, but it's never actually true. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. Cheyenne, right? Masood. Uh, Masood, OK, sorry. So what is m here, m plus 1? m is the center of uh, OK, so here m is the, so we're saying the size of the filter is 2m plus 1. So that's our, our filter goes m this way and m that way. I just want to make sure that this is odd, the length is odd. Yeah, yeah, we're just assuming that the length is odd to make our lives easier. So 
Um, so that's right. The, the filter extends m this way and m that way. So each row of here, each row of this matrix has two m plus one non-zero elements because that's just the size of the filter. And then there's some issue here of how you handle boundaries, which again we're not worrying too much about. This picture is showing the conservative version where you just don't compute it if w is falling off the edge, but you can also extend the matrix. Um, sorry, uh, if, if I wanted to uh, represent a picture in a matrix, I need a three-dimensional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's right. So here we're, we're still talking about 1D convolutions. Mm -hmm. We're not yet talking about X as an image and we're doing 2D convolution. Sasha? Um, so if you represent W horizontally like that, so that would be the equivalent of, like, if we go back to looking for vertical or horizontal edges? Is this the case where we're looking for the horizontal edges? Uh, so Sasha is asking, is this the case we're looking at horizontal edges because W is a row? So no. That was uh, 2D convolutions, where the input was an image, and we were sliding the thing all around to get the output, which was also an image. Here, we're just talking about 1D. The reason why W is in the rows is because that's how matrix multiplication works. Each element of the output is a row of the matrix dot producted with the vector. And that's exactly what we're trying to accomplish here because we're just trying to center that W at different places on top of the vector. And we're putting these zeros on either side so that each time it gets centered at a different place. OK, my four minutes are up. So, but this is a good point, actually. The shorter W is, the more sparse the matrix is, right? Because the W takes up however big the filter is. And if the filter is only length 3, there's going to be a lot more zeros than if the filter is length 21. OK, so I, I already said this last time, but now I'm arguing it a little bit more, that convolution is just a matrix multiplication. So if I want to learn a convolution, in a neural network, I can just do everything the same, but I have to enforce that my W matrix has this particular structure, two aspects of the structure. One, tons of zeros in all of those places. So those weights are out of the picture. I don't need to learn those. And two, that all of those elements are the same. So element 1, 1 of the matrix is the same as element 2, 2 of the matrix because they're both just the first thing in the filter. So I call that sparsity, a bunch of zeros, and these shared weights or tied weights that these bunch of weights have to be the same, those bunch of weights have to be the same because actually instead of having this be a 100 by 100 matrix, say if that was the length of x in the next layer, instead of having 10,000 parameters, this matrix only has seven parameters if seven is the length of the filter. So it's a lot fewer parameters than before. Right, okay, so sparse, we said, repeated parameters, we said, reduces, we said. Um, this, we talked about just a rough calculation of how bad it would be if we didn't do this convolutional thing and we just took a so fully connected layer or fully connected network, <coughs> that means the same thing as a full matrix with no zeros in it and none of this stuff. Because in those arrow diagrams, fully connected meaning every circle over here is connected to every circle over there. You have all those arrows. That's the same as saying you have the whole matrix. And then putting zeros in the W is the same as killing off some of those arrows. So you could say sparse W or not fully connected, they mean the same thing. Okay. Okay, talked about that. Talked about that. Right. So Now we have merged the two sides of the story. One side of the story is convolutions are really cool. And the other side of the story is this W matrix is going to have ridiculously many parameters in it. That's going to give me overfitting and be really slow and everything. And we, we can say, OK, I'm going to do convolutions. That is just a special case, as we now see. And so all the stuff that we've talked about all applies, all the, a lot of the optimization, the tricks, the nonlinearity. The backprop, it's all pretty much kept the same because we haven't changed the fundamental 
what it is, we've just kind of imposed some extra constraints. And so we're getting there. We're getting there. OK. OK. So convolutional neural networks, also known as convnets, also known as convolutional nets, also known as CNNs, typically have three types of layers. We are used to having two types of layers, the matrix multiplication thing and the nonlinearity thing. We typically have one extra step here, which is, oh, ah, OK. So, so you can have a fully connected layer, which you, so you can have interspersed convolutional layers and fully connected layers. There's nothing stopping you from doing that, but typically the fully connected layers will come later when you've reduced the size of things so that you don't have some giant matrix full of numbers. So convolutional layers look like this. And now we have made a fundamental step from what I showed you before, because before I was just showing you one filter. But what you're actually going to do at a particular layer is you're going to learn multiple filters. So remember I said you could do all kinds of features, the edge thing, the blurring thing, horizontal, vertical, this, that. You do all of those in one layer, and then you have a whole bunch of features coming out. So that all happens even in one layer, and the matrix looks like this. The first chunk of the matrix is the first convolution represented in matrix form. And then the second chunk of the matrix is the second filter represented in matrix form. And so if I hit a vector x with this, I get the result of convolving with the first filter concatenated with the result of convolving with the second filter. Uh, this is not actually how I like to think about it, but it's, a, it's valid and probably instructionally useful. Gareth. So each one of these so like two, two sections would be like a node in the CNN? Or? Sure, except the question was each one of these chunks will be a node in the CNN. Yes, except I maybe wouldn't call it a node anymore because those circles we were drawing were just a single number. But now each node is, is actually an image yeah. or a, 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 a signal that is the result of convolving the input signal with the filter. But otherwise, I actually, I like that way of thinking about it. Yeah. Because, yeah, I like that way of thinking about it. Yeah. OK. Godwin. Um, so do we choose the uh, Ws, like the brick example? Or? Right, right. OK. Thank you. So do we choose the Ws like in the brick example? So the whole, the key take home today is in the brick example, I was showing you what convolutions can do. And I picked W. And I said, here's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like. But what's, gonna ha what's happening here is that we are learning those filters. And the whole thing about neural networks is simultaneously learn the feature transformation and the supervised thing at the end. So we're simultaneously learning all these filters and whatever stuff is happening at the end to actually make a prediction. They're all just W. You can think of them as a giant vector. You can take the, the gradient. You get all these partial derivatives. You take a step with respect to all those parameters at the same time. So the number of filters is also hyperparameter? Yes. The number of filters is also hyperparameter, sort of like, and this is why I like Gareth's way of thinking about it, before we got to pick the size of each layer, like am I going to have 10 hidden units, like k equals 10 or k equals 20. So now we get to pick the number of filters, which is kind of the equivalent hyperparameter to that. How many nodes do I have? But there are more hyperparameters because I also get to pick the size of the filter. Like is it this big or this big? Or when we're in 2D, is it 3 by 3 or 5 by 5? So the plot thickened a little bit in that there are more hyperparameters, but I think that is the right way to think about it. And more filters equals more parameters equals more complexity. All that stuff applies. All that thought process applies the way it did the last few lectures. Yeah, I don't know your name. Uh, Sherry. Sherry. Yeah, I was wondering how many rows would there be in W now? Like, what's the number of features in um, How many rows would there be? That's a slightly complicated question because it kind of that's why I said I don't love this way of thinking about it. I would say pick this k, which is the number of filters. 
don't worry too much about this anymore. Just say I'm going to pick the number of filters and then the thing coming out of that layer is going to be one output image per filter because each filter is going to get applied to the input image and then I get the output image and so I have this kind of stack of images. I'll move on. Okay. Um, don't really have time for that. Okay, so the third type of layer, which is not something we talked about before, is called pooling. This is when I was mentioning before that we were foreshadowing. This is a very, very common approach that after I apply my convolutions, I often take, in some way, combine the outputs in a little neighborhood. So, for example, max pooling means I take the image, I apply the filter, I get a new image, and then my new image used to be 100 by 100, but I make it 50 by 50 by taking each block of four and taking the max. And the intuition is sort of like what I was showing you before. Is there a spike somewhere around here? Um, this is kind of a weird thing, but also I think um, Okay, the, yeah, there are two ways of motivating this. One way is this idea of invariance that I didn't really care if it was right here or right there. But practically speaking, what's good about this is it just reduces the size of stuff. And really a big challenge here is still images are big, number of parameters big, a lot of numbers. And this, you can think of this as kind of toning things down a little bit um, with a lot of working in practice standing behind this. Kevin. So you wouldn't just use the filter and never use second pixel? Yeah, okay, that was the thing I skipped in the previous slide. Uh, uh, Kevin S. can use a filter in every second pixel, so that's called the stride, and you can do that as well. Yeah, that's yet another hyperparameter. Okay, so you are Cheyenne, right? Yeah. Okay. So does this 4353 three represent the results of individual filters? Yeah, so. Um, Cheyenne was asking what these numbers represent. Yeah, so imagine you have some image, you do a convolution with some filter, this four by four image is what comes out. Then before I proceed to feed it into the next layer, because we're gonna have a bunch of layers, I actually um, do this max pooling thing, take the max of each block. Okay, another question, that, is there a correlation between the number of filters and the number of like label, class labels that is there a correlation between the number of filters and the number of class labels? Not really. The number of filters is a free hyperparameter. Like in the fully connected neural network, the last layer needed to be equal to the number of class layers. So you could have all those probabilities, but you could do whatever you wanted in those intermediate layers. <coughs> it's the same thing here. <coughs> OK. Um, so this part, I don't know how to do it just right. I, I know how to pitch it at a level that is a little more than I really expect you guys to know in the course or not do it at all, but I'm just going to try to do it. Um, but we don't actually dedicate enough time to confidence in the course that I will later expect you to be able to reproduce every single detail of what I'm about to say. So here is this kind of meta language that I'm going to talk about next week called Keras, and this is how you define one of these things. So, I initialize the network, and I say I'm going to add a convolutional layer. And in this case, it's I'm getting it ready to predict on this famous handwritten digit data set that has 28 by 28 images. So I tell it the input is 28 by 28 by 1. The so 1 is, well, if you have color images, that would be a 3 because you have three color channels. Here, they're just grayscale images, so I have a 1. And then I say I want 5 by 5 filters in my first layer, and I want 32 of them. And then go. And now I'm going to have 32 images coming out of here for the 32 different filters. And the images will be roughly the same size, 28 by 28. In this software, by default, the boundaries are handled by just throwing away the stuff off the edge. So the output image is slightly smaller. Like those question marks from last time are just thrown away. Um, then I do this max pooling that I mentioned. We talked about dropout. I can, that's not really relevant to what I want to say today. And then I have another convolutional layer. So this is saying the, the, oh, I don't want this, actually. Okay. 
Um, so now I'm going to have another convolutional layer. Again, I'm going to have five by five filters. And I want to have, again, 32 filters. So this is the, the, the trickiest part. Um, there's, there's this word channels, the number of channels. And that number is sort of like k in our original thing, or what Gareth was calling number of nodes. So my preferred way of thinking about this is that the image dimensions are kind of a separate thing to keep track of. But what we're really starting with at the beginning is one, just one channel. And then we're going for, from one to 32. So we're going from one image at the first layer to 32 images at the next layer. So it's kind of like I have a 1 by 32 matrix to get from 1 to 32, except the matrix is actually much crazier than that. But in analogy to what we were doing before, I think that's how you should think about it. And then if I want to go from 30, a layer of size 32 to another layer of size 32, it's kind of like I have a 32 by 32 matrix, except there's these other dimensions floating around. Um, but I think that's a, a reasonable way to think about it. This flatten says, OK, at some point, I'm just going to take all the images I have. And I'm just going to flatten them into a giant vector and then do a regular softmax thing at the end for prediction. And you might think, well, why is flattening OK? I just started today by saying flattening is not OK. But the point is we're not flattening the original pixels of the image into some vector. We're doing some very weird stuff to the image and making it smaller and filters and all these things and bringing together, as we do more convolutions, bringing together less and less local properties. And eventually, we just have some bunch of numbers that may not have that much spatialness left to them. And at that point, we just say, OK, I just have these bunch of numbers. I'm ready to flatten them and do a regular softmax layer, a regular linear regression layer. And at that point, I'm going to discard the spatial information. But hopefully, those numbers are much more meaningful features that I can use to predict than my original pixel values are, which are pretty not very meaningful features. OK, so to really understand um, exactly what's going on here, you kind of need to be able to count the number of parameters. And I know I don't have time to go into this, um, but you have access to this if you're interested. To really understand every step of what's, what's going on, you can just say, OK, exactly how many filters, 5 by 5 by 32, plus biases, plus pooling, and all these things. And I've kind of written out my thought process of counting how many parameters there are. and. Um, this software package, Keras, also has this summary, um, which is really nice for understanding what's going on, where it basically tells you what's going on at each layer internally. This is not the same model. Didn't run this cell. OK. That was a different model. There we go. OK. Um, so it sort of keeps track for you at each layer how many parameters are there. and Again, this is all very fast and hand wavy, but roughly the first one I said was kind of like going from 1 to 32. And so you have not that many parameters. And the second layer I kind of said was like going from 32 to 32, which would be a bigger matrix. And there are more parameters. And then you flatten the thing out. And it turns out that you have 5,130 features that you've learned through this weird process. And then you're just doing a regular softmax. Uh, Sorry, 513 features, 10 outputs. So you have a 513 by 10 matrix at the very end. And that's what ends up happening. So take a look at this later um, if you are interested. Yeah, no expectation that anyone was able to, to follow that. <laughs> OK, um, as I said, I didn't, I, it was hard to find a middle ground. So, Today, we continue talking about convolutions. And the really fundamental point for today, points are A, regular neural network is problematic for things like images, signals, videos, speech, um, but especially these higher dimensional data types. Because if you just flatten everything, you A, throw away a lot of information, and B, 
have this too many parameters which is computationally bad and can cause you to overfit really bad. And convolutions are a sensible way of transforming images into features because they look at local structure and then you build it up supposedly to higher and higher level of abstraction as you go through the layers. And the key was that, oh, these are actually one and the same. This is just a special case of what we were doing before, ish, <laughs> because I can just write this thing as a matrix in a special way. Um, and that's it. So have a great holiday weekend. We'll see you Wednesday. And then last lecture is on Friday. <laughs>